good um, to just have a Sunday morning where we can take time and say, Lord, we give you our hearts this morning. Lord, we, we give of our time because we long to be with you. And you know, one of the things I've been hearing a lot is, I miss church, I miss the people. But there are times where I just, me personally, really miss God and offering worship and praise on Sunday mornings. And so it is so good to be gathered together as God's people. We have a responsive call to worship this morning. It'll be on the overhead in a moment. Brothers and sisters, we are gathered here to proclaim a power beyond ourselves. God is our refuge and strength, a present help in time of trouble. We know that we do not have the ability to save ourselves. We surrender our need for power and control and look toward the mystery and hope that is the kingdom of God. We acknowledge our need for God to work in our lives and transform us so that we may receive and share God's love and grace. Thanks be to God. Amen. It is so good to worship our God, and we're going to begin with a time of prayer, but we'll also combine that with community prayers just um, as a change of schedule today. So I invite you who are here, and of course anyone who is listening at home or on YouTube, um, I won't be able to hear your requests, but if you'd like to share your requests, and then we'll leave a time of silence for everyone to just share those needs. Anyone here that would like to share joys and concerns this morning? Oh, a new nephew has been born this morning. Wonderful. Thankful for new life. School is starting up, so we'll be praying for uh, those students and those who get to finish or start university online, um, however that's looking. And for our s seniors who are going to school and... Yeah, we need prayers for that for sure. Any more? We're praying for patience. Let's come to our God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that we could be here today and take a moment and give of our breath and our hearts to worship you. To just kneel before you and acknowledge that you are God over all things, that you are the Lord who holds everything in his hand, that you are the God that in the midst of everything, you come to us and you say that you love us. We thank you, Jesus, that no matter where we are, you have gathered us together to worship your name and to receive your refreshing as we offer our praise, and as we offer ourselves. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your Holy Spirit that provides for us guidance, provides for us an opening of your word that we might understand, who opens our hearts. We thank you, Holy Spirit, that you also convict us of those things that we have held on too tightly for ourselves and that we need to release to you those things that we have said and done that have caused harm to those both near and far to us, we pray that you would forgive us. We thank you, Holy Spirit, that you convict us to step up and speak for the rights of the poor and those who endure injustice. And we pray, Lord, that as we grow in understanding all of these things and as we receive your grace, that this world may be one in which all people can live and breathe and have their being in Christ our Lord. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you this morning for the greater community and we thank you for those who 
experience the joy of new life, the birth of a new child. We pray your blessing on these new little families, and we ask that your hand be on these children, that they would be a blessing to their parents and be a blessing to their community. Lord God, we want to just ask your favor on our students who are going to school and those who return to daycare and those who are returning to work. We pray, Father, that you will bring a new rhythm in life that can be enjoyable, that can be free of anxiety, that can be a, a place of mutual trust in our fellow human beings. And Lord, that we may be kept safe. We pray, Father, that you would open the, um, the young minds that are learning and seeking to be educated, that their education may go well. And we pray that in the midst of everything that's going on, that they may still be able to form good friendships and, and be able to hang out with friends and make good social connections. And Lord, we, we pray for patience. And we, we may be patiently waiting for things to change, but we, we pray for a patience to live fully in every moment that you have given us, praising you in everything we do and say, that we may glorify you. And Father, as we enter into this time of worship, we pray that your spirit would come and be with us. And lift us up and shape us into the kind of people that you desire us to be shaped into. Lord Jesus, as we move forward, we surrender to you our hearts, our minds, our wills, and our actions to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's have an opening song, When We Pray. When we pray, it actually opens up our hearts to participate with God. And so, as the song says, you know, there's a lot of things that happen when we pray. And it changes our hearts first and opens us up um, to hearing God's will in our lives for ourselves and for those around us. And that's such an incredible, powerful thing. One of the things that we have been praying for has been PWSD and their response to Beirut. And um, this congregation has given $2,300, um, just amazing for such a small congregation. And so uh, that is being matched through P PWSD's um, partnership with the Canadian Food Grains Bank. And so our monies have double, doubled. Um, and this is what happens when we pray, is responding to God and his graciousness. Um, our offerings continue to um, be a way in which we worship God. Offering isn't just something we're obligated to do. Offerings are something in which we worship our God by giving of our first fruits, so to speak. So you may continue giving of your gifts through PAR, um, through the online donation on, the, on our um, what do you call it, website. And of course, if, if you're here, you can drop something off in, in the baskets as well. We worship God this morning also by hearing his word. And that can be a vulnerable place for a pastor to stand here and say that I speak the word of God. But again, with your prayers and your support, we trust that God's Spirit is working through this interpretation of his word. We trust that God's Spirit is working as you hear the word preached today, that it may transform you in some way, or that it may challenge us in terms of how we understand God. This morning, I'm going to talk to you about surrender. Oh, don't squirm. Surrender isn't so bad. How bad is surrender? We have a friend who, who tells us this story. She had a number of older brothers. 
And, and they would pin her to the ground, and it was so yucky, honestly. So they had sticky saliva, for lack of a better word, and they would hang over her head, and they'd allow this sticky saliva to drop right above her eyeball. And then they would slurp it back up and then drop it back down, make it, and they would say, surrender. And eventually, of course, she would, because it was so terrifying. You know, when we think of surrender, we might think of something like, you know, when our Canadian soldiers were sent off to Hong Kong back during the war, and, and the Japanese came in, and these poor young Canadian soldiers were so ill-equipped, and they were just being bombarded to, to a point in which they said, we surrender. And 1,600 of the 1,900 who, who managed to live through it surrendered and became prisoners of war. You see, surrender is this thing in, in which we, we come to a point in which we give up our rights and we submit to another authority. It's not comfortable. And it's certainly not always a good thing. Surrendering is the thing that most people do as a last option. But that's maybe not always the case, and we'll learn about that today. That sometimes surrender can be a good thing, even though it may feel uncomfortable at times. I don't know how familiar you are with the story of Jacob, and I'm, I'm talking mainly about a story in, in Genesis 32, but Jacob, as you may or may not know, was a young man who from the day he was born clung to his twin brother's foot as he was born, as if to say, me first. And you know, Jacob really lived that life the whole time. Me first. He stole his brother's birthright. He stole his brother's blessing. He, he found the woman of his dreams, but she was the second daughter. And, and he preferred to marry her rather than the first daughter. He was always deceiving and conniving. Well, here in, in chapter 32 of Genesis, Jacob finds out that his brother Esau is coming toward him as he is leaving his father-in-law. And fear grips him, and why not? Don't you think this brother would be pretty upset? He's got nothing. No inheritance. He didn't even get the blessing. And so Jacob anticipates that his brother is angry. And so he, he sends appeasement gifts along the way. And the night before he's about to meet his brother with 400 men, Jacob was left alone, it says at verse 24, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. And when the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip, so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, let me go, for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go until you bless me. The man asked him, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome it seems like during this wrestling match, Jacob had, had met his match. It took all night. He fought hard. And then God asked Jacob, let me go. At first you want to think, well, what's going on here? Is God losing against Jacob? Oh, man, like, please let me go. But we know that isn't the case because we just read that with one touch of the hand on Jacob's hip socket, he, God wrenched his hip so that Jacob lived with a limp, for the, rest of li um, a limp with the, for the rest of his life. So we know that God could overpower him if he wanted to. Why is God asking Jacob, please let me go? See, it's, it's this wrestling that we all run into with God. Where, where you want God to take control of your life, you want to surrender, but then there's something in you that says, I will do it myself. I will control it. And it becomes this wrestling match of tug and pull and push and, 
And here Jacob is having that final match with God. See, he's already made this plan. I will appease my brother. I will do this and I will do this and then my brother will be in control. But just at the beginning of chapter 32, God says to Jacob, don't worry. I've made you a promise. You're going to be the father of nations. Trust me. But Jacob isn't quite there yet. And so God comes and wrestles with him and God is basically saying, all right, Jacob, here's the line. Let me go now and I won't bother you again. I'll let you do it on yourself. You go ahead, let me go. And then I'll just get out of your life. I'll step back and see how you do. And then the penny drops. And Jacob realizes, man, I can't do it without you. I cannot go forward in my life without God. And so he clings on to God and he says, I will not let you go until you bless me. And in that moment of surrender, God changes his name from Jacob the deceiver to Israel, who will be the father of nations that still bear his name. Have you been there? Maybe you are there. Have you been trying to do things on your own? determined to succeed, hell-bent on whatever dream it is that you have to so sure that you can kick a bad habit or certain that you can change that pattern in your life given the right opportunity, you're going to get ahead. Ask yourself for a moment, what are you living and striving for right now in your life? Is God a part of that picture? really a part of it or is God a name that you go oh yeah I walk with God oh yeah God's there that you invite him in to your life at arm's length that he's a convenience partner that you ask him to join you when you've already decided how you're going to do things ask yourself in this moment whatever it is that you're striving for is it worth continuing if you let go of God Are you willing to wrestle with God through the night until you give up your self-reliance? Are you willing to wrestle with him to the point that you will not let him go until you receive his blessing? See, sometimes we're afraid of that. I think sometimes we wrestle with things and we go, yeah, I wrestle with that. But it's hard for us to face our own brokenness. It's hard for us to face letting go of our own self-reliance. I know, I, I fight with myself all the time and with God. But this morning, I want to say that it is far better for you to spend time wrestling and fighting with God and figuring out whatever it is you're questioning, whatever it is you're longing for. It is worth the battle and maybe even a shifted hip if it brings you to the point where you know you can't go on without God, it's worth it. Speaking of shifts, I take you now to some of our travels in Israel where we went halfway down the Mount of Olives and came to the Garden of Gethsemane. You know, my thoughts often when I think of the garden is is Jesus praying for unity. And, And sometimes in my mind I think that's such a beautiful prayer. And it is. It's a powerful prayer. But I don't always like to think about how much Jesus was wrestling with his Father in heaven as he prayed that night. From Matthew 26. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. He said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Talk about wrestling. Stay here and keep watch with me. And skipping a couple of verses, going a little further, Jesus fell with his face to the ground and prayed, my father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. Now Gethsemane, the word itself means oil press. 
And today, the first century olive trees are still in that garden. These ones here have been there all that time. Now, olives, as you know, are a very hard, hard fruit, and you can't just squish them in your fingers. And so once harvested, they would have to be ground with heavy stones. Now, again, you can't push that. You're going to need a a number of people to help you turn that stone around that vat, maybe a donkey or a mule to help you pull that, and the weight of that heavy stone would press those olives into a paste where we haven't even gotten to the oil part yet just into a gooey paste and then they would take that gooey paste and gather it up into into these um, weaved baskets that had a little flap and the paste would go in under that flap and then you would press that on the side and then you would put that basket in a hole and then press heavy rocks on that so it press 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 and underneath this vat this is a rather this is a very huge one this is an industrial vat that I'm showing you here today that oil would slowly seep out now there would be three pressings the first press would be the best olive oil you would get about 10% of it of which the people were asked to give their first fruits to God, to surrender it to God. The second pressing would be good enough for cooking oil or whatever perfumes maybe or that kind of thing. And the third pressing would be used for your oil lamps. Now Jesus came to this garden in which he was crushed for our transgressions, says Isaiah 53. And he was pressed to the point in which he sweat blood. This was no quiet prayer time. This was an all-out, all-night wrestling match with his Father in heaven. And like the olive press, three times Jesus prays as he wrestles to surrender to the Father's will. His full humanity has never been so evident as in this moment in which he knows the suffering that will come to him and the death, knowing that he was about to die as he now begins to carry the weight of God's anger against all unrighteousness, unjustice, and sinfulness in the world pressing in on him. We cannot imagine that. We cannot, and we cannot avoid that this is why Jesus came, to carry our burdens and the burdens of the world. And on that third time, Jesus cries out, my father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away, unless I drink it, may your will be done. You see, Jesus already knows that God's anger because of his justice and his holiness cannot be taken away unless it's paid for, unless justice is sought. And Jesus now knows at this point that he has to drink this cup. And the cup, if you read through scripture, is often referred to as the cup of God's anger or that terrible word we don't like to talk about very much, wrath. All of that which would be normally punished by God. And, and, and don't run away from this because there's not one of us sitting here today or watching today that has not said, I want justice against that person or that institution because they're bad and I want justice. Know that God says that about each and every one of us. But he doesn't pour out that wrath on us because by grace, Jesus Christ wrestled in the garden and took it upon himself and made that shift through the night. Lord, I will drink the cup so that your people will be free and experience grace. Why did Jesus do this? Well, The Apostle Paul says, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. What a profound, profound blessing.
we will all suffer. But by the grace of God through Jesus Christ, we will never ever have to carry the anger of God if we turn to him and surrender to Jesus. Our surrender is not like Christ where we need ever repeat what he has already accomplished. Rather, our surrender continues God's work of redemption. Surrender brings purpose to our lives just as Christ's surrender had him turn from ministry and being with the people towards that surrendered, I am here to die for God's people. Have you surrendered? I'm not necessarily talking today on whether or not you've made a decision to follow Jesus. However, if you feel that you haven't made that decision yet, then that's a really good question for you to ponder. Rather, I'm, I'm asking, have you surrendered as a follower of, of Jesus Christ and acknowledged that you desire him to lead you into his purpose rather than your own. That he will lead you in every area of your life. You see, that, that takes an all-out wrestling match. When was the last time you wrestled with your self-sufficiency and surrendered it to God? When was the last time you prayed to your Father in heaven, Lord, whatever you want out of my life, I want to give you. Whatever you want me to give, I'll give. Whatever your will is, that is what I want to do. What is it that you're still holding on to in your life that will bring you to that point of wrestling? That you need to surrender? I'm guessing you probably already know. Because that's the grace of his Holy Spirit. Resolve today, all of us, to seek God in his kingdom, to have Jesus be your first love. Respond with obedience rather than resistance. Resolve, God, you have my surrender. We're going to pray that now as we listen to the words of Lauren Daigle, Lord, you have my surrender. Let's lift up our hearts to God. Please stand for the benediction of our God. People of God, as you surrender, know that you are a new creation in the Lord Jesus Christ. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen.